I'm here with Matt Kohler, a partner at Benchmark Capital. Hello, Matt. Hey, Mike. Thanks for joining me. Sure, thank you. Uh, so this is the first time I've interviewed you at uh, Davos, but uh, I usually am able to talk a few of the people from Silicon Valley into sitting down with me every year, talking about the conference and also what's going on with you know their things back home. So I appreciate you doing that. Sure. So I actually interviewed you when you left Facebook, you did. which was a year ago, a little over a year. Over a year ago. Yeah. And you left Facebook left some stock on the table, I assume. Uh, you were one of the earliest employees, and you left to become a partner at Benchmark Capital, one of the top firms, venture firms in Silicon Valley. Possibly best known for investing in eBay at a, what was it, 5,000% re return? I don't know. They never even cashed the check, did they? That, yeah. That's so the story goes. We talked about this, actually. In the, I interviewed you, and it was Bill Gurley. Right. We talked a little bit about that. But obviously, Benchmark has come a long way since then as well. Yeah. What's it like being a venture capitalist? That's great. It's a lot of fun. It's, <laughs> it, it is. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I don't. It's not for everybody, for yeah. sure. But I always thought it was for me, um, and I still think it is. I think it takes a long time to figure it out. I've only been doing it for a little over a year. Uh, the cycles are long cycles because you see a company through yeah. from the very early days until the company is much more mature. So I don't think that I have a full picture of it after just a year. But so far, I'm having a great time. As with everything in life, it's all about the people that you're with every day, and it's a great group of people. So well, what, what's, been, what's it like at Benchmark? It's one of or the only firm that is completely communist, right? In the right. sense that they split evenly of the management fee and the carry and everything. If you're a partner, all partners are equal. And these are guys that have been doing this for 20 years now, right? Right. We're, yeah. all, we're all general partners in the fund. Yeah. We're all managing members. It must be company. great. Yeah it's, yeah, it's terrific. A young partner at another firm, even top firms, you're still fighting for a long-term position, and sometimes they shed partners. Benchmark just seems like you're sort of stable. Yeah. So I'm getting a few messages here. Uh, my Nexus One is. Uh, I right like one. mine. No, it, it, it's, you, it's Nexus a great, One is your phone. I have. I have. A, it's one of my phones. I have many. Um, What's your go-to phone? My BlackBerry. Um, uh, yeah, I, so. uh, but but anyway. The, What's a day like at yeah, Benchmark? Well, I want to answer your, your last question yeah. too. So it's it's. Because it is a unique model, you're right. Um, and I think it's great because it really enables us to stay focused on the one thing which really matters for us, which is helping Making entrepreneurs money. to oh, build, no, helping yeah. entrepreneurs to build great companies. Yeah. That, I mean, really, that's what, that is what gets yeah. us up in the morning and motivates us, and that's yeah. why I do what I do, and that's why all my partners do what they do as well. Um, so it makes for a great day-to-day -day working environment. But it also means we can put all of our energies into finding great investment opportunities, finding great entrepreneurs, and helping those entrepreneurs to build great companies. So, um, Benchmark isn't an investor in Facebook, although I assume you still hold stock in Facebook. Benchmark is a small investor in Facebook uh, now through the friend via acquisition that occurred. Oh, of course. Ben Benchmark right. is not, a, I forgot, it was yeah. not was not an early venture investor in Facebook. Okay. So, um, uh, but Benchmark is a major investor in Twitter. Right. And uh, you're not the board member for that, no, but I assume that, you know, what do you think of Twitter? Uh, you know, as an investor, uh, you you guys got in. Was it the last round? The billion the round prior, to which the was last valued round. at like three hundred million. Yeah, actually, I think that was. I actually think they announced it. But anyway, yeah. the rumor was that was around a three hundred million dollar valuation, something like that. What do you think of the business? I think it's a great company. Um, yeah. Ev is here, and yeah. so he, I, you should talk to him about the company. If you haven't already, maybe you already interviewed him this week. No, no, I mean, we, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember last year, I posted some uh, documents that came uh, from Twitter. I and, do remember that. And, and Evan and I are now talking again. Great. But it's not like we're BFF and picking up things <laughs> together. So, um, uh, but, you know, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, the question I'm asking isn't what's the revenue or something you want to say. Just how, what do you, th let me ask a different way. What do you think of Twitter really compared to, say, a Facebook? In terms of, is it a, is it a, is it Facebook without pictures? Is it what is what is it? How is it different? Are they competitive? Ev has asked us when oh, we get those sort of questions to, to not them answer them at all. So I'm going to direct you. Back oh, that's why I want to be a good partner to to the company. So you should talk with Ev. He's here. Do you think but Facebook and company. Twitter are competitors? You know, I don't think Facebook ever thinks about itself in terms of other companies out in the yeah. market, and I think Twitter is probably the same way. Can we talk a little bit about um, how you see Twitter maybe becoming a billion users, 500 million users, or you don't want to talk about that at all? I don't want to talk about it at all, sorry. 
Okay, let's talk about this. Yeah, no, no. Let's change gears then. Talk about the investments that you've made so far. I know you've made at least one, right? And talk to me a little bit about those and what you think of those companies. So, first of all, at Benchmark, because of the way that we're set up, we all sort of do everything as a team. So we don't really think about investments in terms of my investments and, you know, Peter's investments. Are you on any boards? I'm on a board. Okay. So I'm on the board at Asana, which is a new company started by Dustin Moskovitz and Justin Rosenstein. Dustin was the co-founder of Facebook. Yeah, the so you're The true co-founder yeah. of Facebook. I know him very well. We worked together there for four years. Yeah. Justin was an engineering manager at Facebook, yep. and I worked closely with him as well. Yeah, and Benchmark invested in that round. That's correct. Yeah. So we, we like that round. And, and tell me about that company, what you think. And, yeah, yeah that's, that's a great company. Yeah. It's still very early. They raised a, a, a relatively large venture round early in their life cycle simply because there was a lot of interest in the company from the venture world. Yeah. Um, but uh, what they're trying to do is to create a fundamentally better order of magnitude, better approach to enabling enterprises and organizations to collaborate. So it's a reinvention from the ground up, starting from the technology up of uh, how people communicate with one another and collaborate with one another in organizational contexts. And the company's very early. A lot of people have said, is it in stealth mode? Is you know, It's really not in stealth mode. It's just early in its life cycle and early in its development. Okay. But they've already uh, developed some really compelling technology. They're going to be uh, talking about that in the near future. And I'm um, really excited to see where it's going to go. So just one formal investment that you made in the last, since you've joined? Well, I've helped out with all the investments okay. that I've made since I've joined. But that's the only point that it, I'm really- I, I've heard venture capitalists can usually handle, you know, 10, 12 board seats, something right. like that. So, I mean, do you see that, it, you think in a couple of years you'll be up to that, or you really think one or two a year? You know, as 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 great opportunities come, and to the extent that I you have, have the opportunity, no. Yeah. No. There's no, there, there, there's no. Benchmark sounds like a pretty freaking cool place to work. I'm, I'm very lucky. Can you, can it's I? It's a phenomenal. Maybe you phenomenal. need an official blogger, or I could become a partner there. I could become a partner. I, I think I think you're doing just fine with what you're doing. I think what you got going on is a little better than I what I got what going, you got going on. on <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think you'll do this the rest of your life, or do you think at some point you're going to get the bug? Maybe ten years, but we get the bug to be an entrepreneur and start your own company. I don't know. It's a great question. Um, I you've never this, started your own company. I have never right? started my own company. You were at LinkedIn. That's right. Yep, that's right. Where were you? Where were you before LinkedIn? I was at McKinsey in Silicon Valley before okay. LinkedIn, and I was at a startup in Beijing, China. Okay. I was at McKinsey in 2001 and 2002 during the nuclear winter in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, Good times. Yeah, oh yeah, great times. I'm sure you remember. No traffic on no the 101. That, that, was, that was a huge plus. But other than that... Of course, I didn't know that because I don't, I moved out of Silicon Valley because... Did you? Yeah, well, we'd sold our company. Anyway, this is about you know that, but I moved to England for a few years, which oh, right, right. I remember that. it wasn't much better there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the... Um, the um, what you said is right. I, I've never started a company. Part of why I became a, a general partner at Benchmark is that I've never really been a founder. I've always joined startups. Uh, I joined LinkedIn and joined Facebook before either company had raised any venture money and then just sort of helped out as a utility infielder and an advisor to the entrepreneur and just yeah. you know, did whatever needed to get done to help build the company. I think that's relatively close to what venture investors are supposed to do as well. Um, so. I think, you know, I couldn't imagine a better place to be than Benchmark. Um, so I, I assume that, you know, if, if they'll put up with me, uh, this is a great place to yeah. continue to do really the, sort of the same thing that I've been doing um, for an indefinite period of time. How, how, how long is that? How long is life? Who knows? You know? <laughs> how, uh, what's Benchmark's current fund? How, how much money are they putting it's, to work it's, right now? It's, the current fund is roughly a half a billion dollars. Okay. And you're making investments. I mean, you guys make investments in super early stage. You come in later, like you have a Twitter. I call that later stage, even though some funds would still look at that as early stage. Is that it? Just you guys are just out there, almost like just looking for the right opportunities. It doesn't matter. Like it could be a month before going public or two days old. Yeah, we're, we're opportunistic. Yeah. Now that said, if you look at the three dimensions which define venture investment decisions, stage, sector, and geography. We're essentially kind of 80 to 90% Series A, Series B, 90% Silicon Valley, 90, 90% information technology, and that's the whole information technology yeah. stack from semiconductor IP up to companies like Twitter. Um, but that other 10, 20%, if we think there's a really compelling upside opportunity left in the company, 
we think there's still a 10 to 100x opportunity in the future of the company, and there's still really exciting company building to do, and we really believe in the entrepreneur, then we absolutely make exceptions from time to time. Uh, without disclosing any information that you have privately, and if you, uh, I know you wouldn't anyway, but I assume you don't, who goes public first, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Zynga? Just asking as an expert. I have, I have no idea. You think all three will be public within 24 months? I have no idea. Do you see the public markets opening up a little bit? That is an interesting question. Um, I, uh, I, there's chatter about it. You know, investment bankers are, are talking about it nonstop. Now, they obviously have an incentive to talk about it nonstop, so I don't know what to read into that and what not to read into that. Um, what I'll say is this. There's a lot more talk about the public markets opening up than there are S1s getting filed. Um, so until more S1s are filed, we'll see. There's more S1s being filed, of course, and we had a company in our portfolio, OpenTable, go public in 2009, which I think was a very successful IPO. So there's cases here and there where, where What's open tables are, market are cap going today? out. Um, I don't track it on, a, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, but I think it's you know roughly in the five six $600 million range. Do you think Facebook has waited too long to address Foursquare? <laughs> Or do you think... Um, I'll point you back to Cheryl on that one, just as I'll point you back I, to I actually, I, you know, I, I know you can't answer some of these questions because you're a shareholder. Uh, and, I I'm a, and I'm an advisor to the company. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll ask it differently. How, how important do you think Foursquare type, you know, GoWalla, do you think this is a real trend or a fake trend that we're seeing with people using these services? I think it is a real trend, yeah. and I think it's an instance of a broader trend, which is the emergence of mobile, which is something we've been talking about for a decade. Yeah. But it's, it, and I actually don't think we're there yet, but it's, we're really close. You don't think we're there yet because of the, the hardware, the phones aren't there yet, or that they haven't quite gotten the model of the checking market, in it yet? The market adoption isn't there yet. So there is, so when you think about what you need to have that really be a compelling yeah. user experience, there's several dimensions. To just look at a couple of them, location and 3G, and let's just look at 3G as kind of the lowest common denominator. There's only about 20% 3G mobile handset penetration in Western Europe and North America today. Mm -hmm. So the good news yeah. is about 20%. But in certain communities, it's 100%. In certain communities, it's 100%. Yeah. Like but in Silicon Valley, the people we hang out with. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but if you're building social products, yeah. you really need a mass market to have access to the platforms that those social products yeah. are built on. Meaning the door is still wide open for, theoretically, for others. Yeah, well, I think, I think we're going to see many of the companies that are leaders on the web also become leaders on, on mobile. And I think you know, the distinction between web and mobile is, is going to blur. It already is for it me personally. Is, yeah. Absolutely right. Now. But do you think that the GoWalla Go Foursquare model is the right one? Do you think they finally have found sort of the idea of you check in, there's games, it's sort of everything sort of, you know, get, they get you to pull your phone out when you go places and do things. Or is there, right. Do you like that model? Do you think that's sure. a winner? Because uh, two years ago, you know, people were still messing around dodgeball, which became, you know, the Foursquare guy. That sure. it looped has experimented in some different sure. areas. There was, I think, was it Bright Kite? There were a sure. bunch sure. of these, right? Yeah, yeah. There, None of them sure. really took off. I think it's too early. Yeah, but I just think it's too early. You think it's too early because of, of, of penetration? Yeah. Of, but do you think... Now, that said, you know, both Gual and Foursquare, there's really interesting momentum there. Yeah. I think they're both interesting companies. Yeah. They have slightly different approaches to... The, the problem that they're basically trying to solve is how do we create the right set of dynamics for people to want to check in. And to create content, basically. You well, do that's a form yeah, of content. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so both of them, in different ways, are answering that question with, with game dynamics. Yeah. They have different approaches to how they, get, how, how they address those game dynamics. But Josh is, is a great designer, a great product designer. And Dennis is a great entrepreneur, too. So I think you know, it's, it's fascinating to see what's going on with both of those products. Um, but as an instance of the sort of thing that is going to be possible when everybody has mobile, you know, I think it's really very exciting. See, the thing about these social products is there's a dynamic that tends to happen where they flip from being socially awkward to socially necessary. And if you think back to the U.S. in the late 90s, it was sort of a, a stigma to carry around a mobile phone in the U.S. in the late yeah. 90s. Um, if you remember... The movie Clueless, which is an amazing movie. It's one of my uh, favorites. Yeah, yeah, adaptation of the Jane Austen novel Emma. Um, and um, the, the, um, the, the, there's a like, recurring joke in the movie about the fact that these kids have, have mobile phones, they have cell phones. Um, it's like, ha ha, isn't that funny? They have cell phones. And today, it's just assumptive that you have a cell phone in your pocket yeah. all the time. 
I was in Asia in the late 90s, when I came back to the US, when I was in Asia, everybody was already using a cell phone. Yeah. When I came back to the US, all my non-tech friends were mocking me for having a star tech in my pocket. And nobody was text messaging in the US, because you could Absolutely, because you couldn't, because there was yeah, no interoperability yeah. between carriers. Yeah. Um, but, he, but there was also just very little market adoption. Yeah. Um, and so, the, um, you know, the, at that point, it was basically I loved that Star Trek zone, by the yeah, way. It's, it's a good phone. Yeah. It was a really good phone. 20 minute battery life. <laughs> like, literally, yeah. 20 minute battery. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I remember. <laughs> um, the, what, what happened is that flip to being socially required. And when you think about that in the context of, of privacy and, and information sharing, the issue becomes there's a cost to opening yourself up. You know, if you broadcast your location, yeah. that means people can get at you in ways yeah. that you may not actually want. Yeah. And that cost is always present. If you carry a mobile phone in your pocket, people can call that phone number or yeah. send you a text message, and you may not want to be reached yeah. at all times. But as long as everybody else is opting in to that dynamic as well, you still bear that cost, but the benefit you receive exceeds it because you can reach all these people too. Yeah. So in the early days of, of these devices, you know, there's there's more pain than, than there is gain from adopting. And what needs to happen in order for them to really take off is you need a large-scale kind of market-wide adoption of the device. And then the benefit exceeds the cost and the dynamic flips. And that we saw that dynamic flip with mobile phones. I think we clearly saw that dynamic flip with uh, use of the web and identity in the web and sharing of information on the web. I think we're going to see it much more richly in the mobile ecosystem over the next couple of years, too. And I'm really excited about that. The thing I'm most excited about that's driving that is Android. And really, really excited about what Android can represent. Android is great because Android is free. And that's a really, for, for the consumer, and that's, that's a really big deal. To the extent that Google can subsidize the cost of distributing really yeah. high-end mobile devices into the market quickly, that's going to very rapidly move the market forward. So I'm really hopeful that that's going to happen. Do you think and there'll be more Android phones than iPhones at some point in the next couple of years? At some point, I you know I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't make kind of sweeping predictions about the future. I think it's highly likely that there will be more Android devices in market than there will be iPhone and iPod Touch devices in market at some point in the you know foreseeable future. Is that six months, twelve months, twenty four months, thirty six months? I have no idea. Thank you for your time. Appreciate sure, it. Absolutely.